we've got the teams raring to go. We've got a clock. But first, let's take a vote. And bear in mind, this is a, uh, a highly scientific poll conducted by me. And my decision is final on what uh, my uh, fading eyes decide. But um, we're going to do a forced vote. What this means is even if you're on the fence, you're not sure, vote, please, one way or the other. You must vote. Um, and we'll get a pulse of the room now, and we'll take another vote afterward. I'll repeat the motion so that we're crystal clear. This House believes that in 2030, Detroit will still be king of the road, not Silicon Valley. So you must vote. How many of you vote with the motion, based on what you know and what you hear? Oh, my goodness. Wave your arms around a little bit. It's hard to see. There's, OK. All right, well, I'm seeing that as really close to 25% at the moment. Let's see what's on the other side. All right, how many of you disagree with the motion? How many of you do not agree with the motion? OK, yeah, I'm going to call that 25% in favor, 75% against at the start of our debate. Uh, but let's see what the following minutes bring. A couple of things I'm going to let you know. On your behalf, I'm going to keep them to time. And I'm not being rude or any ruder than I have been all day, but they've been warned. I will keep them to time in the interest of fairness. And the usual debating tricks of trying to uh, change the motion as you go along or uh, slip, slip and slide around, I will be on guard as well on those. And both teams have been put on notice. Um, let's go. Uh, team in favor of the motion, as is protocol, you get the first. Uh, first introductory statement, four minutes. Now? Now. Well, <clears throat> well give, him a, give him a bit of applause to get him going. <clears throat> Very good. <clears throat> the question is simply preposterous. Of course, everyone in this room knows in your heart that digits plus widgets, and we just heard this, are the true outcome, the true future of automotive transportation. The House believes that in 2030, Detroit will still be king of the road. And there are some simple reasons, which I'm sure you'll agree with me uh, as I hold forth here. First of all, Silicon Valley can't profitably build anything larger than a Roomba. Now, you may doubt me. You may think, oh, what about Tesla? Well, Tesla is the exception that proves the rule. Apple designs in California, but builds in China. Tesla, market cap, $38 billion. Their net income, anybody might hazard a guess, over the last three years, it was negative $1.8 billion. GM's net income was about $23 billion in the same period. They're great innovators, Tesla may be, but they can't run like a software company forever. The economics simply do not work. Second. We believe that we should be preparing for the revenge of the 100-year-old company. It's simply implausible and inaccurate to short experience, client relationships, legal structures, capital structures, supply chain management, and more importantly than all of that, the access to the data. And some companies have nearly have decades or even 100 years of data, airlines, banks, insurance companies, car companies, it is simply laughable to think that Silicon Valley can overtake that in just a few years. They should stick to digits, not widgets. Third, Elon- Two minutes. Musk, two minutes. Elon Musk knows a lot about a lot, but he knows very little about people. He's right now giving a, search, a speech asserting the benign situation with ultra-intelligent AI is that we, we, would be, we humans would be so far below in intelligence We'd be like a pet or a house cat. Now, anybody that has seen the recent political upheaval globally, regardless of what side you land on, knows that humans cannot be domesticated. Silicon Valley will not be able to accomplish that. The techno dystopians are as wrong now as they ever have been. Finally, this is Detroit's race to lose. There's no doubt the race is on, but it's Detroit's race to lose. But they are already moving. Ford, GM are doubling down on artificial intelligence. They're building their own software. Silicon Valley builds software. They don't build stuff. GM builds stuff, and they're also building software. Just this month, Ford announced a $1 billion investment in AI. There's a recognition that machines must adapt, and Detroit's leaders are already taking the right steps right now today. Thank you very much. You may have how much time? 
Uh, you're, you're, whenever you finish, you, if you, you yield your time. That's it. I yield my Thank time you. to you. Thank you. Um, we, we now turn to the first. First of all, give a round of applause for a, a robust opening. Thank you. Thank you for, for keeping within your time. So we heard um, uh, digits and widgets are going to win. Um, uh, a needless swipe, I thought, at the poor little Roomba. What did it ever do to you? Um, and the revenge of the really old companies. OK, so we see the first battle line drawn. Let's see what the side opposite has to say. Give him a little round of applause to get, to get him going. All right. Sir, the floor is yours. First correction, the Roomba was built in Massachusetts, not Silicon Valley. We'll start there. Uh, digits versus widgets, this is the perfect argument. Two thirds of the last car you bought was made of steel. Steel is really important, it turns out, in building cars. It provides the structure of the car. It keeps you safe if you happen to get into an accident. We can't have cars without steel, or maybe a little bit of aluminum, but let's say mostly steel. But if this debate today, if the question was, who will be the king of the road, the auto industry or the steel industry, none of you would be in the room today. It's not an interesting question. No one out there thinks that steel is adding value to the car. Steel is a commodity. As consumers, we don't make decisions based on the quality of the steel. We accept it as a given. It's not steel. It's not a big deal. Nobody cares. The question of this debate is, in 2030, where will the value in the car lie? Will it be in the software, the brains of the car that will make the car safer and smarter? Or will it be in the steel shell that the software happens to be pushing it around? So it's digits and widgets. And spoiler alert, the value lies in the software. The value is in the digits, not the widgets. So here's why the software is going to create value. Number one, this is how we will be buying cars in the future. We'll be looking at the software, not at the hardware. We'll care more about the digits than we will about the widgets. The last time you walked into a car dealership, all of you in this room, did you really look very hard at the horsepower numbers like we used to back in 1979? Maybe a few of you but probably not most of you. You were probably more interested in the safety features of your car, the fact that it could steer itself in traffic and start and stop and do all these wonderful things. The software is where the value is created when you go to purchase your new car. But more importantly, the software is what enables completely new business models around transportation. You know, we sold about Two 80 million, thank you, 80 million cars worldwide last year. If we assume it's about $20,000 a car, it's a trillion and a half dollar market. It's a big market. But globally, we drove 10 trillion miles. So if we could sell those miles for a buck a mile, we've got a market opportunity that's multiples of the personal vehicle uh, point of sale market today. This is a completely new business model that Detroit has not even dipped a toe into and is ill-suited to address. It's the software that's going to enable new, en new entities to address that business model. So lastly, why Silicon Valley and not Detroit? Why is Silicon Valley better suited to address these opportunities? Well, geography, first and foremost. If you want to build software, you go to where the software developers are, and they're in Silicon Valley. There are four times as many software developers in Silicon Valley as they are in Detroit. Follow the talent. Number two, the core competency of these organizations. Car companies in Detroit sell cars. That's what they're designed to do. There's a lot of infrastructure around selling that car, servicing that car, getting it out the door. They're not built to build software. Companies like Google, like Apple, they're built to build software. They're built to build the software that's going to go on tomorrow's cars. And then lastly, as I mentioned, the business model and a commitment to the business model. Selling miles, selling kilometers is not the same as selling cars. And in fact, it could cut into that core business seconds. selling cars, which has served Detroit pretty well over the last many decades. So it is digits versus widgets. It's software versus hardware. And if you look at this debate from that perspective, it's very obvious that Silicon Valley and not Detroit will be king of the road in 2030. Thank you. All right, very good. So uh, a robust uh, response in the first opening statement. Did a bit of jujitsu with, uh, with the digits and widgets there. Um, and of course, uh, talking about a legacy business models actually harming Detroit rather than helping. Um, Let's see how, what the uh, uh, defenders of Detroit have to say uh, by having our second opening statement. Uh, please, uh, a warm round of applause for our second speaker from the side in favor. The floor is yours. Uh, th thank you, Vijay. 
I, I guess our opponent, uh, Carl, said that it's software versus hardware, the value lies in the software. I completely agree. But the question is not about whether software has more value than uh, hardware. The question is whether Detroit will dominate or uh, Silicon Valley will dominate. Right? The key aspect that you have to keep in mind is that for any entity or any sector to basically extract the maximum value of anything that happens out there is whether you control the platform and the ecosystem around it. Detroit as the platform, Silicon Valley has nothing in this space. There is no platform that Silicon Valley controls. I guess uh, my colleague talked about Tesla basically being negative. I guess uh, their market cap is very high. There is always a bigger sucker born, I guess, uh, sucker being born every minute. But basically, if you look at the financial flow, Tesla is not a viable company as far as I'm concerned. And if you look at everybody else, Google started, quote unquote, building autonomous vehicle technology in 2009 by hiring people from institution and beyond. And today, it's about seven, eight years later, they have spent hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe exceeding a billion dollars at this point in time, they have not made a single penny, a single dollar out of those in investments. When they are going to make their first pieces of money, not clear. I guess they could start making money when the technology is completely mature. You replace uh, a human driver with a completely driverless operation. That's going to take many, many years. So who controls, the, I guess, Google like, controls Android, Apple controls the iPhone, but they do not have the underlying ecosystem on which they can actually deliver that value and monetize it. It's just not happening. Okay. And meanwhile, as the automation technology evolves incrementally, there are advanced uh, driver assistant systems, safety features that uh, Carl talked about as well. Those are features that the car makers are the ones who are introducing on an incremental, evolutionary, natural, organic basis. They are the ones actually monetizing it as we speak. And then as more and more features like uh, uh, super cruise on the highway show up. Two minutes. They will actually benefit even more, right? It, it may take 10 years, 15 years for the human to be completely replaced. The automakers will be making throughout the process. Google slash Waymo, right? Uber, for example, Uber started their uh, autonomous vehicle research in Pittsburgh again. I uh, guess uh, spending up to a billion dollars, right? But they do not have the business model or the mature technology to basically monetize it anytime in the near future. Ask yourself, would you bet on Uber, which is basically losing upwards of uh, uh, two and maybe two to three billion dollars every year? How long are they going to be around in, in, in order to be, and be investing in this space, right? Absolutely no platform to build up on. Um, so that's number one, so it's a lack of platform. The second thing I would say is that uh, building a vehicle is no easy task. Tesla, by the way, Tesla Motors is no longer Tesla. They even basically even renamed the company basically as Plan B, or basically will actually be a battery company. Plan C, we likely will uh, sell batteries uh, to uh, consumers, right? Plan D, uh, maybe uh, we'll take uh, people on uh, SpaceX to the moon, right? Maybe to Mars. What is going on here? This is not a car company to even speak of, right? Uh, uh, thirdly, I guess I guess already talked about the business model and the incremental automation. Let's talk about uh, uh, alliances, right? So for example, I guess because they understand they do not have the platform, Google, for example, has been deploying these uh, pods, uh, these pods, if you will, and they basically now have said that we are not going to be building cars anymore. They're just basically placing random beds on random things, and they're realizing that they, they cannot really cut it because they do not have the supply chain, the relationships, the capacity to basically design a vehicle, assemble it, sell it, support it, deal with recalls several years down the road and so on, this is not for the meek, right? So take the underlying business model of Silicon Valley. Google or Apple, if they actually have a profit margin of less than 40%, it's been a bad year. All right, we're gonna have to let that be there. All right, give them a round of applause. We can see the gloves are off. Well, had there been any genteel uh, overtones, it's gone now. Not only is there no platform, no profits, now he started to uh, you know, trash talk the companies themselves. You ain't no car company. Okay, let's turn to our uh, final opening remarks. Uh, please, a round of applause to cheer him on. So uh, first I wanna thank you for the introduction. A serial entrepreneur. At least I was not introduced as a uh, master debater, um, which I thought would have been awkward, but I've got to say, just having lived within the car business for a very long time, challenging the status quo, I need to be careful about what I say. Because when Vijay first called, he said, I want drama. 
I want you to draw first blood. I want you to really make a big point. I say that to everyone. <laughs> so I thought long and hard about how do I say this in a very sort of elegant or nice way. But this is really not a debate in the classic Godzilla versus whatever style. It's not old versus, or I'm sorry, it's not good versus evil. It's uh, not even gas versus electric. It's not a binary decision that we're debating. We're really deba debating um, about offense versus defense. And at an innovation summit, it's pretty obvious that everybody here has an orientation towards innovation being the winner. So that we would start from a position of strength, I think, is, is worth at least acknowledging. In the automotive industry, this debate has already been had. In every automotive boardroom around the world, the question is how did companies like Tesla or Uber even come to pass? And what can we do? And these are folks who are focused on their survival. And this concept of what we're debating up here is really offense versus defense is really not as much about who's going to be the king of the road as it is about can the old school defend itself. And so when thinking about the argument, two minutes, you have to take a look at what does the old school have as an advantage. And of course, the, the opponents have, have identified you've got an infrastructure, you've got a long history of building vehicles, you've got brands in the marketplace that people trust, you've got a distribution network, you've got almost two million human beings in the United States alone that are in the, in the process of helping to distribute and sell cars. And so in a lot of ways, the old versus new debate, the offense versus defense debate, is one about innovation at its core. So it's appropriate that it's the topic of, uh, of this. But we've seen this before. The idea that we're going to have the revenge of the 100-year-old company is almost antithetical to an innovation debate. I mean, we've seen it before in retail versus Amazon, Blockbuster versus Netflix. It's, uh, it's also important to understand how the capital markets think about this. The capital markets reward potential very differently than they reward good performance. Traditionally, incumbents or the 100-year-old companies are about well-run organizations that know how to generate a profit, as you pointed out. But unfortunately, those companies trade on a multiple of earnings, not a multiple of revenue. You have companies like Apple and Google who have a stated objective to get into the automotive business. But yet, when you look at those incumbent advantages, the question is, where is the reward going to go for the, for the innovation? Already, what we're seeing in terms of innovation is being validated by the old companies investing in new companies. If that's not proof that there is a better business model, what could be? the incumbents investing in new companies and aligning themselves because at the end of the day, talent goes where there is a financial reward. If you think about what created the tech revolution of the late 90s and really the internet bubble in the first place, it is about financial reward for that very big X factor potential. We're going to have to stop you there, Scott. Um, thank you. A round of applause. So the team has gone on offense against the the defense, as it were, by arguing uh, that the old school is really just defending itself, and what better proof than following the money, right? So look where they're investing, investing in the new software companies. Um, this now is a time for rebuttals, and we're going to come to the floor uh, shortly, but first I'm going to give uh, each side a rebuttal statement. I, they have three minutes, first again with the pro team, and they're welcome to use it any way they want, the three minutes uh, between the two of you. You can share, share your time. Go ahead. Okay, so... Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> so absolutely, I, I would agree with some of what the, uh, the Silicon Valley team said. Uh, but if I, in fact, I found it actually arguing more for Detroit. Yeah, absolutely, Detroit is investing 
in uh, new new companies and innovators. Um, that's absolutely true, and that is absolutely why we think that Detroit is making a lot of the right moves to move into the digits plus widgets economy. Because clearly, and again, I agree with, uh, with the Silicon Valley side that, that software is essential to value creation. There is no doubt about that. The big question is, where will that innovation come from? And to assume that the software and systems, the AI inside of a car will come from Silicon Valley simply because they can create Tinder and Facebook is preposterous. It's not gonna happen. This is why we think the digital economy is moving from digital that's fun, Instagram, and so on, to digital that matters, which is how does a car work? What does a car mean? What does transportation mean to us? If I want to take my family around the Washington DC Beltway 495, I'm not gonna do it on an iPad. I'm gonna do it on a Ford or a GM car because they know how to build safe cars. If I'm looking for an autonomous golf cart, maybe I'll go to Google, but not to drive my family around 495. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Let me draw also, also a fundamental distinction between what uh, Silicon Valley is good at and what the car makers do. What the car makers do is basically build a product that actually operates in the physical world where safety is the fundamental value that we're seeking, right? Where people can, do not get hurt and uh, God forbid do not die, right? Think of any Silicon Valley company that basically builds things that actually operate in such a safety critical, safety conscious environment. I bet you you cannot. Right? Writing software for an, for an IT device is very different from basically building something that has been tested to very rigorous standards, and when things go, do, uh, when go wrong, they do go wrong, you need to be able to deal with that. So that nature of physicality uh, basically makes a huge difference uh, in the, the two, two ecosystems. 30 and seconds. Then, and today, from a startup perspective, you basically are doing a startup in uh, AI or anything else in the automotive vehicle space. Your dream is to be bought out by a car maker. Right? So GM basically buying cruise automation, Ford buying Argo AI, uh, GM investing $500 million into cruise and so on. Right? And last but not the least, Apple, the, like one of the biggest companies out there, if you will, maybe the biggest company, bumbling and stumbling in this particular space. All right, tell us what you really think. No, all right, thank you. Thank you for the first rebuttal. Let's hear from the other side. Let's see what you got. So Paul, you said you would prefer not to drive in a car that was powered by a tech company. You would be somewhat unique. The World Economic Forum just released a study two days ago, and what they found was that two thirds of respondents actually wanted to drive in driverless cars that were put together by both traditional auto companies and tech companies. That was their preferred mode. I will let you guess which part the tech companies are gonna do and which part the traditional autos are gonna do. I'll give you the answer. The traditional autos are gonna do the handset, uh, I mean the car, and the tech companies are gonna do the software, okay? This notion that there's a missing platform is simply false. How many car makers in the world do you think in the audience built last year cars at a volume of more than 10,000? Let's say, you know, significant scale or above. 20, 30, 75. 75 car makers out there are ready and willing to put cars on the road at scale. Silicon Valley doesn't need Detroit if they're looking for a dancing partner. And the notion that the platform is the value, well, Foxconn would like to have a word with you. Apple's making obscene profits, and there's a lot of people sweating it out in those factories in China that would love to capture some of that value and haven't been able to. I would add uh, just what is the definition of king? Um, is it going to be who produces the most cars and just simply gets them out on the road, or is it gonna be who creates the most value as an enterprise for doing that? I can see an argument where you could say, Detroit's gonna be distributing Silicon Valley's innovations, but if that's the definition of king of the road, that's probably a near-term likelihood, because physics are what it is. You've got an existing distribution system and you have just an overwhelming large-scale advantage in terms of what's happening. But today, if you looked at Tesla's market cap to cars sold ratio, it would mean that Ford would be worth about $2 billion, not $49 billion. Tesla today is nearly $45 billion in market cap. It is being rewarded for delivering that innovation. And so I think the, the really interesting thing about platform is 
while it is an important thing, it's not the heart of the issue. It's sort of where Detroit has missed the point. It's where the old school has missed the point entirely and where not just Silicon Valley, but the new school in technology has a huge advantage. It's about the customer, the platform versus the customer. We are in the most dynamic era of automotive innovation in automotive history. More is up for grabs right now than has ever been before. There is more money that is willing to invest in new ideas that are disruptive than ever before. It's probably why you all have a natural bias towards the argument that innovation and the new school will win. But at the end of the day, all of that will lead to lots of new innovation where we begin to think about how we relate to cars very differently. It's really about the car becoming a service. And that is an area where Detroit cannot compete because if you, you have to leave it, it there, Scott. That is an area where Detroit cannot compete. Um, so you, you hear the argument, platform, no platform. Uh, this is where the, uh, the, the grown-ups are. The software is not all same. These are the, this is the innovation crowd um, are making their case. Now, let's open it up to, to you. Um, you have your chance now to ask the two sides a question. Uh, I will also join in to keep them honest on this. Um, anybody want to take the, uh, the first jab? Who wants to ask a question of one side or the other? I'll, I'll do my best to even out the, uh, uh, the punches, of course, in fairness. Let's get a, a, a microphone to the gentleman here. Oh, sure, yes, go ahead. Identify yourself, please. Hi, uh, Sunil Radia from RGA. We do business transformation work. Sure. Um, I had a question about the role. For which side, if you can tell us? Oh, I was hoping both would answer this. All right, okay. Well, let's, let's see how good the question I, is. Go on. But you know what? I'll, I'll go with uh, four. You're going to direct it for, to yes. the pro team, okay? To the pro Although team. I, I encourage both sides to jump in if you want to uh, challenge an answer or, uh, you know, in any way um, uh, advance your cause. This is the time to do it. Uh, so, yes, go ahead. How important is the ability to deliver high service in this future, given mobility shifting toward being more service oriented and, and certainly uh, autonomous is enabling that? Um, and there may be some geographical differences in, in how those locations think about the role of service. Okay, question was directed to your team. I would uh, readily concede to what uh, Carl said earlier. Uh, there's a lot of value uh, in the software side and services side, mobility as a service, uh, I guess, uh, think car sharing. Uh, the question is, who gets there first, who basically has control of the platform, right? For example, the uh, analogy with Foxconn, I thought it was very disingenuous, uh, right? Foxconn just manufactures on contract, right? The design and the platform is owned by Apple, right? So here the cars are owned by the car makers, not by any of these companies. So whatever Apple and Google are good at, basically the GMs and the Fords of the world are investing billions of dollars as we speak the best brains, if you will, on the startups and so on. Basically, they understand that there is a lot of value in the software stack. They're actually trying to squeeze that out right now. And as long as they control the platform, they're in good shape. Any challenge from this side opposite? I think if the debate is going to go to who are the customers going to love as a way of defining who's the king of the road, I think it's a, uh, a hands-down uh, win for technology because I live every day in a world where retail is really um, at, the, at, the, at the point of the matter, and, and you've got almost no industry where consumer trust has been more violated than in the automotive industry. Probably all of us can relate to the, the notion of buying a car and not wanting to go into a car dealership, but millennials today do not want to go into a car dealership. So if you look at the incumbent advantages of, of the old school, you've got infrastructure, talent, brand, and business model. And I would say that on all four fronts, the argument is, is not sound for, for the old school. In terms of the infrastructure, it becomes a legacy problem. It's a 30-year de depreciating asset, a, an investment in an old technology. In terms of talent, talent will clearly go where they're going to get compensated, and they will get compensated in Silicon Valley and the new school and all of these new companies, much more so then, and it's just in the tail of the tape in terms of enterprise value and market cap. In terms of brand, you've got more global automotive brands leaving the stage than ever before. You've got 100-year-old brands that are wiping out in favor of 10-year-old new startups like Tesla. You've got, I think, brand attached to a very fundamental proposition, which is this business model issue, this distribution, which is really the last and final anchor, albatross around the neck of the old school, which is if you have to sell cars into a push distribution system. You are selling what fundamentally does not match consumer demand. If you are pool-based manufacturing, you have all of the advantages of a greenfield approach where you are able to actually satisfy the customer's needs 
from, from ground one. Let, let me stop you there, Scott. You've, you've uh, had a good run there. Uh, let's, let's get a few more questions. I'm pleased to see uh, three or four hands. So let's make them sharp questions and sharp answers, please. Great, this is for the Silicon Valley side. Okay. Jason with Javi. Uh, my question for you, Apple is a good example, very cash rich right now. Um, if they were gonna do this, why would they release Apple CarPlay and things like that to these competitors? If they really thought they could build cards, what are they waiting for? I would, you know, it's not at all clear that Apple's gonna build a car. So Apple has realized, I think smartly, my reading of the tea leaves, I think they went down the path of potentially building a car. I think they realized that the value lies in the software. That's what they're good at. That's what the customers care about. And that's what they can do better than just about any, any, anyone in the world. Aren't you supporting the argument these guys are making then? Actually, let me. No, well done. No, let me, let me, not, not at all. No, I mean, uh, no, no. no. Okay, finish your thoughts. Silicon your Valley thought. company yeah. focusing on the software as a way to extract value from the automobile platform. Okay. Google, same story. They've perfected or near perfected self-driving technology. Uh, instead of not finding, you know, counter to what our, our opposition would suggest that they would not be able to find a dance partner on the automotive side, Fiat Chrysler has lined up at their door. Honda has lined up at the door. They'll be the first two of many more to come. Automotive companies who don't have the capacity, the scale, or the internal resources to develop this highly valuable technology themselves, and therefore are going out to partner with these very non-traditional players from Silicon Valley. Lastly, you know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Uh, can you guess how many of the major OEMs and tier ones in the world have an operation in Silicon Valley? All of them, every one of them. That's happened over the last 15 years. Every OEM, tier one in the world has set up shop in Silicon Valley to drink the water and try to, by osmosis, if nothing else, All right. capture some of the magic VJ, can I add that's present in that part of the world. Let me go up the side opposite, then I'll come back to you. 30 seconds both, please. Let me make a couple of very quick observations. Uh, number one, Apple's biggest asset is the fact that they integrate, they integrate, design the hardware and the software together to yield a perfect customer experience. So that is the asset that they have, right? Let's keep that in mind. And then I guess in the uh, software market, I guess uh, the profit margins are upwards of 40%, right? The car segment you need to be making profits off of a 10% profit margin, right? So it's a completely different ball game, which is why the Silicon Valley companies really do not know how to basically survive in this market space. And uh, lastly, I guess, uh, with respect to startups, I guess you see all the investments pouring into uh, Pittsburgh. The Rust Belt is actually becoming a, a smart belt. All right, Scott, 30 seconds. We all live in a very technologically interconnected world, and we're a bit overwhelmed by all the choices. But what Apple really did was iTunes, not the iPhone. The idea that Apple could win your account, your customer relationship, is really the big win. What we're going to become very aware of is the integration of technology and finance. Today, you've got a trillion dollar car market in the United States alone between new and used cars. 90% of that is financed with financing and leasing. It is not paid for by cash, by the average consumer. The average automobile represents 50% of the gross income of the average American. So auto finance is integral. FinTech and the smartphone coming together are really where you can transform the customer experience. And this dynamic age automotive era where we're literally seeing everything being up for grabs means that who wins the customer wins that ability to reshape their experience. And so the idea that um, Silicon Valley is going to somehow capture some, some part of your technology wallet or get you to sign up for another account when the world is becoming simpler, not more complex, is a losing argument. Let's hear the question in the back. Actually, um, we have, we're running a little short on time, so ask your questions here. I may also get another question from this side, and the teams can respond. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Rhett Skelton. I'm with Skylight Intelligence. Um, my question relates to, you talked a lot about safety, and we also uh, um, talked about the Jeep hacking incident earlier. So between the two, how does cybersecurity play into the role of who wins? Cybersecurity, okay, I've taken note. Um, I saw a hand over here. Is there still a hand on this side or a question? Perhaps it's been answered. Okay, let's come here to the middle then. Um, uh, microphone's coming. Uh, right here, in the middle table here. A short and sweet question. Designed by Ford, driven by Uber, powered by Panasonic. Who's king? <laughs> Did you guys get that question? Driven by Uber, was it? Designed by Ford, driven by Uber? Designed by Ford, 
driven by Uber, powered by Panasonic. Who is king? Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was time well, for riddles. I, I can, okay, well, I can maybe. So, so but <laughs> consistent, consistent with the argument, in that, ar in that argument, Uber is king. Uber controls the customer. And if Ford were to lose the battle of that platform to General Motors or to Tesla, then it would be Uber powered by Ford. I, I think you have Tesla, a... Or I, powered I, by go whoever. On, go ahead. <clears throat> it's where you the, raise a good, you raise a the good customer point. is paying for that ride, that mile, with their relationship with Uber. You raise a good point about customer love. I, I think that that is an important point. And I have found in my experience that customers really love you if you don't die. <laughs> so if your iPad crashes... Just taking a morbid turn. You don't die. Well, we're talking about security, right? So the, 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 the question that we need to really answer, this is the difficult part, right? The question we need to answer in order to decide Detroit versus Silicon Valley is... Is it harder to build a two-ton vehicle that can drive 70 miles an hour and crash into a wall and everybody lives, or Flappy Bird? <laughs> no, no, so, okay, actually, all right, yeah, all go on, go on. Let me go back to the question. Okay, a, a rebuttal, it's much easier to move really? to software expertise because we all agree that software is essential to value, but that is much more fungible. It's much more portable than the capability to build the vehicle. That is the answer. Is, is, is it your contention, though, is it your contention that those innovations, those scientific developments are going to happen internally in Detroit, or are they going to happen based on Detroit investing in other companies? That as, an, as an example, Detroit? Uber, right? the entry barrier to Uber's car sharing space is very low. Any number of companies around the world have created this technology. There are uh, companies in China, of course, uh, Uber quit and so on. Ford would do it, want, want to do it itself. GM would want to do it itself. Uber is not in the picture, should not be in the picture. And as Need I saw, you were, you were trying to say OEMs with 10,000 cars volume or higher. You know, the question here is blindingly obvious. Ford sells that car once. They make a profit of $3,500. Panasonic sells those batteries once. They make $650. Uber can drive that car and earn a dollar per mile for 150,000 miles. Which spot do you want to be in? Yeah, okay, now this notion that is the software Uber, is all Uber, created equal so, is just what, simply So false. the Uber driver of the future is going to carry everybody around? It's a driver of some conveyance. Unless we're going to go to rickshaws, then, and I just came back from Mumbai, <laughs> unless we're going to go back to that model, then there still needs to be a car in the value chain. The car will not come from Silicon Valley. So Google, I, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. The uh, debate was not whether or not Detroit's going to survive at all. Now, as an Whether example, who's going to be king of the hill? Vice left. Listen, let me, let's address the first question. Uh, the rickshaw would be safe from cyber attack, so that <laughs> does have a good point. Favor. Uh, but we did have a serious question. Uh, each side's 30 seconds. Give an answer to the gentleman asked about cybersecurity. Who, who is better positioned, uh, Silicon so, Valley so, or Detroit? So cybersecurity is a primary concern no matter what, particularly in the physicality domain. People can literally die. It's not just cybersecurity. It's about cyber physical security. The car makers as of now, basically very active with their entire supply chain to make sure that intrusions cannot happen, right? So this is not like uh, you're sending over an update. Your, your I, I think there's no, there's, no, there's no more well-known case of having lost consumer trust than automotive with consumers. I think that consumers will continue to vote with innovation, and the idea that Detroit is actually going to champion safety over innovation and technology when, in fact, the entire Google effort and investment into autonomous driving is about improving safety and saving lives almost above everything else. It's because they have the ability to afford that with their large R&D budgets that they can actually take on such a project. All right, we are at the end of the, uh, uh, the fisticuffs portion of the evening. Um, we will now give each side two minutes uh, to divide as they, as they choose um, uh, amongst themselves uh, to, place the, 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 to present the final case in front of you, and then we'll take the vote. So um, I give the side in favor of the motion two minutes. Uh, give them a little bit of a pause. Get them going here. This is your last chance to win the crowd. So let me quickly summarize. Right? There's a lot of value being created in the space. There are lots of uh, benefits, economically speaking, societally speaking. But at the end of the day, whoever controls the platform basically gets to get the value. Right? Uh, so with respect to the platform, the card makers have it, right? And they actually have uh, realized that actually they actually have the platform, investing big time, uh, recruiting talent and so on, including basically having uh, uh, startups in the mix, uh, Ford's investment being a case in point. Uh, second, 
I guess uh, the value add services like Uber, basically instead of uh, them actually ally, uh, striking alliances with Uber, they just need to basically build their own technology or buy a company in space like Lyft, they basically get to keep the whole pie. Let me start. So it's sure that Silicon Valley and the mindset of Silicon Valley of creating, creating software, creating innovation has a role to play. But I submit to you that the debate in itself is framed by fear. And what I mean by that is, and I, if I step beyond uh, the auto manufacturing uh, milieu, whether it's banking or retail or manufacturing, everyone in every sector all over the world looks at Silicon Valley as some sort of talisman of creativity. And it's true, right? There is a kernel of truth there, but there's also a sense of fear that emanates, like we will be Ubered, or my bank will be Ubered, or Facebook is going to take over my hospital. That has not happened, and it will not happen. 30 seconds. So the, I think the real answer to the debate is two questions. One is, who can build that car, that actual physical vehicle? Because we are not changing. Humans are going to stay the same, and we want to move around, and that requires a vehicle that has great software inside of it. The extrapolation, and it's a wild extrapolation, that Silicon Valley will be able to build that capability. So I ask you as the voters to not be afraid, do not be fearful of Silicon Valley, to embrace what's good of Silicon Valley, but recognize that the center, the heartbeat of the automotive industry will be the manufacturing zones like Detroit. They have the skills, they have the capability, they have the cash, they have the knowledge. Thank you very much. All right, very good. A round of applause for their concluding <laughs> arguments. And now, your two minutes. So Paul, that argument would have been incredibly compelling in 1984, but it is 2017. This is about digits versus widgets, as you said yourself, software versus hardware, business models that are willing to be embraced on the west coast of the United States and not embraced elsewhere. Business models where you can earn this wonderful thing called recurring revenue, which Detroit has been so forceful about giving away over the years, service, insurance, we don't want any of that. We'll sell you a car once. Silicon Valley says, we'll sell you something every day. We won't sell you a car, we'll sell you transportation. It's an entirely new perspective on how people will get around in the future. Silicon Valley will beat Detroit because of the geography. There's more talent there. It's where the people are. You go to where the people are. It's the competency, and it's this willingness to embrace new business models. Thank you. So I think the, the fundamentals of the argument are clear that um, infrastructure, talent, brand, and business model are all changing. The infrastructure itself is a bit of an anchor around old Detroit, but the idea that the capital markets and consumers are going to vote for a new way of thinking about the car as a service means that the 13.5% of what Americans earn being spent on mobility is now up for grabs in a very new way. And that is going to go to business model, new brands, and a better relationship with the customer enabled by technology. All right, very good. A round of applause for the final arguments of the side opposite. All right, so you have heard two fiery teams put their case forward. Um, platforms, profits, people, it's all there. And the power, the most important P, rests with you to decide the winners of our debate. Um, I'm going to ask you once again. It's a forced vote, so you must vote one way or the other. I'm going to repeat the motion as well in front of the House. This House believes that in 2030, Detroit will still be king of the road, not Silicon Valley. Hands up. How many of you agree with that motion? Hands up. I see less than 25%. How many of you disagree with that motion, vote against the motion? OK, I'm going to call it in favor of the team opposing the motion. Congratulations to you. Oh, well. But also, please, give a, a round of applause for an excellent hard-fought fight by the team in favor of the motion. Thank you.